Well, thank you all for being here. You may be seated. Uh, thank you, Pete and Christy, for reading for us. Thank you, worship team. Hey, if you're a kid, you're dismissed. You can make your way out the side or the middle. You'll be met in the back. Uh, just want to reiterate what Alan said earlier. Um, right after service, we're having a free lunch for you. Um, the, the point of this is, hey, if you've been coming for a while and you want to get involved, uh, you're like, hey, how, how can I use my gifts? How can I use what God's given me uh, to serve in some way or another? Um, that's the, this is an opportunity for you. You can come, you can listen to the different opportunities to serve, and you can be like, eh, don't want to do any of them. You can leave, and we won't hound you after that. So you can come, check it out, but I encourage you... Uh, uh, if you call this your church home um, and you're excited for what God's doing, I want to encourage you, part of being a part of a church is, is using your gifts. God has given us all a spiritual gift, and it actually brings us joy and purpose and meaning when we use those. So hope you can join us for that after service if you have the time. But if you're uh, here just as normal, open your Bible to Mark chapter 5. Uh, Mark chapter 5, we've been going through the book for a while. But before we read our text this morning, I want to tell you about uh, a lady in San Dimas. Um, there, there's a lady in San Dimas that's been around for a little while, uh, and she walks around. Maybe you've seen her before, um, but she claims that she can speak to demons. Okay, I know, what a, what a start to a sermon. Um, but she claims she can speak to demons, uh, and you'll see her. Sometimes she talks uh, to demons. You can see her walking by. Uh, but she's offered on, on the Facebook, like there's a San Dimas Facebook page, and she said, hey, if you want me to interpret the voices that are speaking to you, I'll do that. Or if you think your house is haunted, you can pay me, and I'll come to your house and rid the demons. Even if your pet you think is haunted by demons, I can fix that for you too. Um, why are we talking about that? Well, well here's the issue. Um, a lot of us hear that, and our initial knee-jerk response is, okay, she's probably crazy, right? You know, there, there, there's no way, there's no way that's real, there's no way that's, that's even a thing. I mean, I stopped believing in Santa a long time ago. I know that's not reality. Um, but the question that, that's kind of hard is if you read this book, and if you read the Bible and you believe it and you're a Christian, um, it talks about demons, and it talks to them that there are real beings and there's this real thing called spiritual warfare out there. And I think there's a lot of people in our world today that said, no, that, that's totally ridiculous. Like there's no evil or right or wrong. Really, uh, that there's no spiritual realm either. It's just what we can see, what we can feel, what we can touch. Um, but even for them, and if that's you this morning, there are moments as you see history that maybe you've asked, and you're like, wow, that just seems evil. Or, or what that person did, even though I don't believe that there's anything behind anything, uh, that just feels dark. You know what I'm talking about? One of the leading shows in America right now uh, is a show about Jeffrey Dahmer. If you don't know about him, he was a murderer, uh, did some horrific things that I won't talk about. I, I don't have the stomach to watch the show, uh, but people are mesmerized by this because they're like, it is so dark and so evil that it's hard to even believe that this happened. See, there's moments like that that you say, well, was it just that he was a sociopath or was there something behind it? You look at history, you look at the Holocaust and you say, was that just racism uh, all because of Hitler or was there an evil force behind that? These are questions that we have to ask. And in society today, the, the sad reality is that the people that do believe in demonic forces, that do believe in that, a lot of them are afraid and asking questions of, what do I do? Well, how do I avoid them? I was thinking about this this week, and so what I did is I went on Google, and I typed in how to get rid of demons. And thankfully, there's a lot of good articles out there, so take notes on this, because this is some good stuff. The first one, if you want to get demons out of your house, here's what you do. You get some sage, and you burn it in your house for about 30 seconds, but you don't just burn it. You've got to open your doors and windows, because, you know, demons have a hard time getting through walls and windows, especially with the double panes nowadays. Um, you know, so you've got to keep them open so it gets rid of them. But if you can't find some sage, you can get, a, it has to be organic, but the essential oil sage, and you can put it in a spray bottle and spray it. That'll get rid of them. So that, that's step one if you're writing out. Step two, if that doesn't work, you can get pots and pans and start banging them around your house because demons don't like the noise and they'll run away. But you have to have kind of a positive mantra and positive vibe while you do that. Okay, step three. I'm not going to go through all of them because you're probably bored. This is a good one. Um, you can sprinkle holy water throughout your house. 
Where do you get holy water? I'm glad you asked, because um, you have to go to somebody who's either a professional spiritual person who is, or has been to seminary. I have a Master's of Divinity, so if you want to see me afterwards, I can get you a discount and whatnot for some holy water. Not really. Um, but there's all these different strategies on how to rid your house or your dog or your spouse from demons. Uh, some people buy Epsom salt and all this other stuff. But, you know, that, that's funny, right? But the sad thing is, is there are people out there today that they are walking around their house banging pots and pans, burning incense or whatever, thinking that this will rid me of any evil spirit. That's sad. Right? And maybe you're here today and you're like, hey, I don't believe in any of this. this that, that's ridiculous. I, you know, I don't believe in Santa. I don't believe in all this stuff. What does this have to do with me? But if there's just a chance that this stuff is real, don't you want to know about it? And if you're a Christian and you believe in it, but you're like, hey, I don't struggle with it. I've never seen a demon before. You know, I've never had any encounter like this. Maybe let's ask this. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you just felt oppressed, felt attacked, felt like, hey, I'm just going through life and then something hits me, right? And now I just feel horrible about myself. I have these self-deprecating, self-harming thoughts that come over me. I don't even know where they came from. Or I get so discouraged, I get so depressed, and I just don't know how to break free. Or I feel like I have these voices in my head that tell me if I keep up with my addiction, if I give into my lust, if I give into the thing that I keep giving into, life's going to get better. I know it's not going to get better, but the voices are so strong and convincing that I struggle. See, I think all of us struggle in some manner, in some fashion, and are impacted by forces that we can't see. And we're going to look at a text this morning that I think is one of the most vivid, helpful texts of Jesus encountering a man with demons. So if you have a Bible, Mark chapter 5, verse 1, we're going to look at it. It says this, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes, And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with the chain. For he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart. He broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. This is a interesting situation, right? To say the least. Jesus gets out of a boat. Uh, They just remember uh, last week we were talking about Jesus calming the water in the storm. That amazing moment happened. The disciples that are on this high, they're like, wow, Jesus can do anything. They get out of the water and instantly they're hit with another scenario. A demon-possessed man, right? He runs out. He lives in a graveyard. The other uh, gospel accounts say he wasn't wearing any clothes, Naked man running around, wounds over his body because he hurts himself, uh, had broken out of chains. Here's the thing. A lot of people read this and they're like, okay, thing is in the New Testament, when it talks about demon-possessed people, here's what it's actually talking about. Back then, they didn't have modern medicine. Back then, they didn't have modern science. So this guy is really just mentally ill. And that's the issue. And they called mentally ill people demon-possessed. Because they just didn't know science, you know? And so this story that you're reading about Jesus, he's encountering people like we may encounter today on the streets sometimes. You know, if you've ever been to Skid Row, L.A., there's some people out there that are like this. It's sad. But it's just mental illness. But here's the thing. If that's true, how is this guy able to break chains and shackles. And you might say, well, sometimes chains get rusty, shackles break, there's a faulty in manufacturing, and so that's what happened. But this is a recurring thing. It says person after person has been unable to bind to this guy. So there's something about him that, that, that's different. There's something about him that, that's causing this to happen that's even deeper. Mental illness is real. But there's something else. Luke 8 says he was a man who had many demons. Here's the thing. Scripture, if you read it, when it talks about demonic forces, because it does a lot actually, um, it doesn't just say that, that demons are bad memories or mental illness or things of your past that you don't want to think about. Because a lot of people today, you ever heard this phrase before, I've got to face my demons 
Or, oh, I've got a lot of demons. And what they're saying, hopefully they're not really saying, yeah, I've got a lot of demons inside me. They're saying that, hey, I've got bad memories, negative thoughts, and things that I have to deal with from my past. Those are my demons. But see, Scripture, when it talks about demons, um, it actually sounds like it's talking about real beings. Look at 2 Peter 2.4. It said, for God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. You see, Scripture tells us that demons are actually fallen angels, right? So at one point, um, there was a time when God, when Satan, who was an angel as well, there was other angels, everything was at peace in heaven. But at some point, in some way, the devil, uh, Satan, said, I want to be like God. I want to exalt myself. And then God threw him out of heaven to the earth. Uh, but there were other angels that joined Satan and said, yeah, we want to be like God too. Let's overthrow him. And he threw them out of heaven. Some of them he threw straight into hell. Others he cast onto the earth for his own purposes so the funny thing it sounds like they're actual real beings and then it says that we should interact with them like they're real beings look at James chapter 4 it says resist the devil and he will flee from you Ephesians 6 says this for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood in other words it says hey you're demons it's not just flesh and blood what's in your brain bad thoughts bad memories but look at this but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. 1 John 4 says, Believe, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God or from a false prophet that have gone out into the world. See, this man is not just mentally ill. There's something else going on. There's something very real very dark, very evil that's affecting him. And in our world today, even though you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it, the Bible says there is a very real and present danger in our world. Uh, there's an enemy, there are demonic forces that are dark and influencing our world. They're not just here sharing space. It's not like you walk down the street, accidentally hit a demon in another realm, and he's like, oh, excuse me. You know, he's like, no, they have a mission uh, to destroy the work of God. And they hate anything that exalts him. So above anything else, they hate believers, they hate the church, they hate all of it. It's not like demons are like, hey, let's make people sin because we get extra bonus points if they sin. It's, hey, let's make people sin, let's tempt them, let's lie to them, because that pulls them away from knowing God. And that's the ultimate goal. What does the Bible say about Satan? It says he's the father of all lies, right? So they lie. It says he's the great tempter, right? And then there's just straight destruction. So there's this opposition, and as people, we can interact. Let's read on in our story if you're still with me. I promise there's hope and some good news to this. But Mark 5, verse 6, let's look at the rest. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Picture the scenario for a moment. You're a disciple. You're already a little shook up because you almost died in a boat. Right? All that. You get on the shore. You're relieved. And all of a sudden you see this nude man covered in wounds, maybe chains still on his body, screaming loud, running to you. I mean, I've been with Sarah when we walk through L.A. or a city. If, if someone that's talking to themselves just looks at us sometimes, you're just like, you, you know what I mean? You're, you're nervous. I mean, imagine this scenario. Maybe they've heard of this guy before that, whoa, this is the guy that everybody talks about that you can't even put a chain on and he'll break it. This guy's dangerous and they see him running towards him. If I were a disciple, I'd be like, hey, Jesus, you know, that's really amazing with the water, really amazing with healing people. I know you're powerful, but we should get back in the boat. Okay, well, let's just leave this. We, we don't need to be here. He's sprinting towards them, yelling aloud, wounds on his body. Disciples are shrieking. What does Jesus do? He stands there, unaltered, doesn't wimp, start cringing stands there and look at what happens next you'd expect the man would run leap on top of Jesus and start beating him right 
do whatever he can, but look at what he says. He ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the what? Most High God. You see, we can just read right through this and not see the significance of this. At this point in history, people were not acknowledging Jesus as God. Not even his disciples. Most of them did not even know he was God yet. They knew he was powerful. They knew maybe he had some angelic power, was something special. But they themselves weren't even fully convinced he's God. And here's this crazy man that runs over, bows down, stops full halt before Jesus as Jesus is standing there and says, you are God. Then we're looking, what? This guy's not even the guy that makes clear sentences. And he says, you are God. Here's the thing. We often see, um, when we think about or imagine like demonic forces and angels, or God and Satan, we often think they're like two equal forces fighting each other. I'm not a huge Star Wars guy, so I'm going to butcher this. Um, but in Star Wars, you know, you've got the force, and basically you've got to bring balance to the force. You've got like the dark side and the good side, right? You've got Jar Jar and Gandalf and all of that, you know? And so basically the whole thing is, hey, we've got to bring balance to this thing because we don't know which side's going to win because they're equally powerful. And we think of that God and Satan is that they're equally powerful and there's a spiritual battle going on. I mean, it wasn't like this. It wasn't like one day God was in heaven and all of a sudden Satan tried to you know, bring a coup and, and t- a mutiny and then God was like, whoa, I did not see that coming. Whoa, angels, we better, we better get on our A game because I don't know how this is going to go. We better come up with a plan B. Maybe I'll have a son, send him on a cross, we'll build the church, hopefully that'll work, but I, I'm not sure how this is going to go down. That's not what happened. God is sovereign in complete control, knows everything, is control of everything. There's never been one single moment in history where God has not been completely on the throne in control of all things. And the enemy and Satan and the devil, they want everybody to think, hey, we're a big deal, we've got it under control, we've got it figured out. Meantime, God says, no, I am in control. This man filled with demons. Notice they say, the Most High God. Jesus, you're even over our boss. You're higher than Satan. You're higher than all the fake gods out here. You're something different. You are supreme. You are sovereign. Look at the language they use. If you go down to verse 10, it says they begged Him earnestly to not send them out of the country. They're begging They're on their knees before Him. I think this is so important for us to know because I think so many Christians live in fear. Let me read you James 2.19. It says, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe in what? Shudder. Tremble. James 4.7 says, Submit yourself therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That verse is not saying, hey, if you do the right thing, the devil will be scared of you and run away. That verse is saying that if you submit to God, the Holy Spirit comes inside you, right, as a believer when you submit your life to Him. And then the devil looks at that and is terrified. You remember the book of Job, right? What what happened? um, Satan didn't come into the throne room of God and is like, hey God, you know your servant Job? Yeah, I'm going to do something. Like it or not, I'm doing this. I hope you respond well. No, that's not what happened. What does Satan do? God, may I have permission to touch Job. God's sovereign. Look at Jesus in the wilderness when he's being tempted by the devil. After Jesus is done with the temptation, what does he say? Be gone. What does Satan do? He's gone. God is completely, at all times, sovereign and in control. And I think we cannot forget this. You know, there's, I think in our society, if you look at it, there's some darkness, is there not? And if you, if you look at society, if you look at the crime rate, if you look at what's happening, um, you can tell, and I think if you open your eyes, if you're a believer especially, and your eyes have been opened, you can see there's some things happening that are concerning. And I know a lot of Christians are coming, they're like, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, man, are we going to be persecuted? Is this going to go down? I'm just not sure. And a lot of Christians are afraid, and I get it. There are scary things. But see, this text is here to remind us that yes, there is darkness in this world. There are forces out there. But God is completely in control. And He is completely omnipotent, 
omniscient, and sovereign. One of my favorite verses is 1 John 4. 4. It says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. Meaning the spiritual force. It says, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's the hope. If you're a believer in Christ, you never have to be afraid. You never have to be like, man, am I going to be attacked by a demon tonight, right? If you have Christ inside of you, the, the power that resides in Him is inside of you. There's dark things. You know, a few years back, I was a school teacher at, at a school in Pasadena. And I had an 11-year-old student. She was an orphan. She, uh, they brought her in from a girl's home. 11 years old, she started dressing a little different. I remember asking her, I was like, hey, you know, what's going on? She said, well, I started hormone treatment. I'm like, what are you talking about? You started hormone treatment. And she said, I realized I've been born the wrong gender. I'm like, well, what do you mean? You're 11 years old and all that. She said, yeah, but I've been meeting with some counselors from the school and whatnot, and they told me that a lot of my problems are maybe because of my sexual identity. And so she started this hormone treatment, and in a few years, she was going to get surgery. And I remember, I don't know about you, but looking at her eyes, an 11-year-old girl who had a mother who was an addict, a father who was an addict, that both passed away from terrible decisions, hadn't had a lot of chance in life, is now an orphan, looking for love, looking for identity, and she's told that, you know what, the answer to that is that you're of the wrong sexual orientation. That's tragic. And I think the Word of God says every person is designed in His image. And I'm not saying this, that we should judge that girl. We should have compassion, right? I'm not saying that as a church, we be like, oh, all transgender people, away. No. But that we should see that the world is under the sway of the wicked one, like Scripture says, who spreads lies, who tells people that the answer to your life is not Jesus Christ. The answer to your life is exploring your own sexuality, pleasing your own self with money, with success, with fame, whatever it is, that these are the answers. It is not Him. But the power of this text is that it is not just all going to hell in a handbasket because Jesus came. And this man's life, right, there was no hope for him. You can't even bind the guy with shackles. Everyone looked at him like, yeah, there, there is not a chance he's making it out of this one. I'd give him a couple weeks and he's dead. He's already living in the tombs. That's good because he'll just die there. Until Jesus got off the boat. And that's what we need to remember for our lives. There is darkness, but there is light. And that light is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that light is the church. And that light is coming again a second time. One of the questions that people ask about this a lot is, okay, I get the demonic part. I get that. Uh, I get Jesus having the power part. I get that too. But what about the pigs? You know, you know why, why, why would Jesus throw them into the pigs? I mean, come on, like, th- this is just weird. Why would the demons ask for that? How does that make any sense that they throw them in the pigs, the pigs jump in the water? I mean, those poor pigs after all, right? You know, I like bacon and all that. You know, why this? But see, it's actually really, really important because the other gospel accounts say this, Matthew 8, 29. The demons cried out and they said, What do you have to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time. What does it mean before the time? What are they talking about? Then Luke 8.31 says this, and they begged Him not to command them to depart into the abyss. See, the demons knew something. They looked at Jesus and they knew He was here to redeem mankind. They knew He was going to die on a cross. He was going to rise again. They knew the plan. But they also knew that there will be a second time that He comes back. Right When He comes back, reigns on earth, and throws all the dark forces into the pit, the fiery pit of hell, which the Word of God says, right, that that day is coming. And they knew that wasn't this time. And so they're looking at Jesus, and they're like, Jesus, uh, if you're going to cast us out of this man, we know we have no control. You're God. Uh, but just throw us into the pigs. We don't want to go to hell right now. They understood. And see, what that's showing us is a reminder that a day is coming when Christ will reign supreme. That's good news. Total side tangent, but there's people out there that get upset and they're like, well, wait a second, you put that man's life over the life of the pigs? You know, how could you do that? And I think that's just another lie of our culture today. I think we should care for animals. I can hardly kill a spider in my house. I used to cry when my brother salted snails. Like, I love animals. You know what I'm saying? Um, But they're not made in the image of God. And a human's life, because they're made in the image of God, is far more valuable than animals. I'm not saying that means we need to abuse them. You know, we should care for our oceans and all of that. But I'm saying is we have to say, no, people are made in the image of God. And why do we value the life of a dog more than the life of an unborn child in a womb? 
right? And so as Christians, we know the truth that no, every person has, needs dignity, respect, not because we decided that as a society, but because they bear the image of their creator. And so that's important. And for Jesus, he says, hey, 2,000 pigs mean nothing compared to the life of this man. So he casts them out. There's hope. But what's the purpose of all of this? There's two things. One, it shows who Jesus is. He's God. He's all-powerful and control of everything. But two, it shows his heart. Jesus could have gotten off that boat, looked at this man, and be like, whoa, let's get out of here. He's unclean. You know Jewish culture, remember the Old Testament law with unclean laws? You know, if you touched a dead body or touched a, a gravestone, you were unclean for seven days. And as a Jewish person, you had to go in your tent, wash yourself, and be alone and isolated for seven days. Remember, there's no Wi-Fi. Most of them didn't know how to read and all of that. You're bored out of your mind for seven days just trying to get away. And then, on top of that, if you touch a pig or around the vicinity where they breed pigs, you're unclean, have to go for seven days and wash yourself. This guy, unclean spirit, living in a tombstone, living in graves, and around pig farms. Any rightful Jewish person would have looked at him and been like, okay, we're out. Don't, don't even worry about the fact that he's possessed, running around, chains crazy, no clothes on. Just the fact that he's been in a tomb and all that, we're unclean. Jesus, as a good Jew, should have said, you know what, yeah, uh, sorry, I can't help you. Maybe if you purify yourself for seven days, we'll get rid of this whole demon thing, then we'll talk. But what does Jesus do? He doesn't run. He doesn't shake goes to the man and says, hey, I'll heal you. Cast the demons out. This is our Savior. This is the message of the book of Mark. It's a message of hope. That, hey, if you're here and you feel like I am too unclean, or I am too far gone, or I'm too sinful, or I haven't been able to break free. I hear the voices in my head that have told me that my lust would satisfy me and I've pursued it time and time and I've gone down so far that I don't think Jesus could heal me anymore. Or the voices that come into my head that say I should cause self-harm. Remember when I was a youth pastor, there was these girls in the youth group in junior high that they would cut their arms to relieve the pain in their lives. It made no sense. It was tragic, the lies of the enemy. And, the, that, and out of that, they'd feel this shame and guilt of I can't go to God. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're like, hey, I'm just so worthless. I'm just so sick that God can't save me. He doesn't want to be around me. He's going to turn his eyes to me. He can't save me. Hey, if that's you, let this text speak to you today. You are never too unclean. You are never too lost for the power of Jesus Christ. That is the truth. That is what this text says. Anyone else would have been like, yeah, that guy's too far gone. On to the next. Jesus says, no, I can save him. And that's true for you, and that's true for me. And anytime Satan comes to you or his enemies and they lie to you and they say, you're too far gone this time. You're too sinful this time. I can't believe it. Why can't you get it right? You don't really believe the gospel because he doesn't, he doesn't love you anymore. You've got to say, no, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Be gone. My Savior is Jesus Christ. The cross is my identity. It's not my life. I'm saved. That's the truth. That's the heart of Christ. So what do we do with this? The people of that time, they saw this whole thing play out. They saw the pigs, they saw the man healed that said he wore clothes after that, he was in his right mind, he was speaking normally. People of the village saw it, and it says they despised Jesus and told him to go away. The reality is there are people in this room or maybe in your life that you said, hey, I don't want Jesus, I want to figure it out my own way. I don't want that, I want to live my own life. There's a lady years ago, named Sarah Winchester. She's the wife of William Winchester, which maybe you've heard of the Winchester Rifle Company. It's one of the greatest gun companies of the 1800s. Um, and her husband passed away, and Sarah inherited all of this money and became one of the wealthiest women uh, on the planet at that time. Uh, but she was troubled. It said that uh, she felt like the spirits that her husband's guns had killed over the years had come to haunt her. 
and that they were coming to destroy her. And she felt like she could speak to these spirits and she was plagued by them. And so what she did is she built this mansion, but she hired all these different contractors and construction workers and said, hey, we've got to confuse the spirits so they don't attack me when I sleep. So she said, you've got to build stairways that go nowhere. You've got to build all these different bedrooms with no doors or too many doors because we've got to make them not be able to find me in this house. And she spent millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. And she isolated herself from the world and was plagued every day of her life. It's tragic. But there are people out there today that are plagued, and they don't even know they're plagued by demonic forces. And they think the answer is in this world. The answer is found in themselves, or what these voices say, or found in their sexual identity, or found in their lust, or found in whatever it be. When all the while the answer is Christ. And the hope is Him. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to build houses, try to hide, uh, burn sage in your house, open the windows and the doors, bang pots. We don't have to do that because we can know Christ. A few applications as we close. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The point of that text is saying, hey, be aware. There is a battle. There are forces out there. You don't have to be afraid. If you know Christ, you're on the winning team. But you have to be aware they're out there. And I think this helps us have compassion on the people around us, does it not? Because we see people and we're like, how do you make that decision? How is that even logical that you believe that? Why are you doing this? This just seems wrong. And then we need to pause and remember, wait. The whole world's under the sway of the wicked one. Their eyes are blinded to the light. My eyes have been opened by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's my job now to love and engage them for the gospel that they'd be saved rather than me to be like, wow, you're dumb. That's the difference. That's what it means. If you're here and you don't know Christ today, you need to believe because you need that power to be saved. Hey, what do you do if you feel like you struggle? You're oppressed by demonic forces? Well, the scripture says this, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you. Flee from the enemy and he will flee from you. Draw near to God. Run in prayer. Run to people in the church. No scripture. How did Jesus fight Satan in the wilderness? What did he do? He quoted scripture. Right? He quoted scripture. Know it. Memorize it. Know the areas where Satan speaks to you. If you struggle with, man, I don't know if I'm not saved, I don't know if I'm saved, or I don't know if I'm any good. Hey, memorize the texts that tell you that you're bought and paid for by Jesus Christ, that you're his own special possession, that you are his child and he is your father. When those voices come in your head, you quote that truth. And they'll flee because they'll realize, wait a second, the truth and the light of the gospel is inside you. I'm not going to win this. I'll go to somebody else. You hold on to the truth. It's the power of God given to you. And it's that same truth that you hold on to so you know you can test the spirits. I've heard people that said, oh, God told me to do this. And you know instantly, that's not God's will, right? But they say, oh, but I heard a voice. You're like, yeah, I think you're hearing the wrong voice here. you got to measure it with Scripture. you got to know because this is the inspired Word of God. So memorize that. Know it. Read it so you can decipher. The Bible says test the spirits to know whether they're from God. Lastly, you don't have to be afraid. If you know Christ, if you know Christ and you're His child, The enemy is afraid of what's inside of you. A day is coming when Jesus will come again. He will reign fully and completely on this earth. And he says he will cast the enemy, cast all dark forces into the fiery pit for eternity. You don't have to be afraid. You're on the winning team. Your God is sovereign. He's the Savior and he loves you. And that's the hope this morning. Before I pray, we're going to transition to a time of communion. And I say this a lot, but a lot of us, when we come to communion, we uh, feel kind of guilty. We feel kind of like, okay, how did I do this last week or this last month? Uh, am I worthy to take this? If you're thinking that, you've got it all wrong. The point of communion is not about your works. It's about His works. It's about what He did. That He is the conquering Savior. And when He said, do this in remembrance of me, He said, look at the bread It's my body broken for you. Look at the wine. It's it's my blood shed for you. He didn't say do this in remembrance of me so that you can remember, are you getting in line? Are you doing very good? Do you have to figure out your life because then you'll be okay? He didn't say that. 
He said, I want you to remember one thing and one thing only, what I've done for you. That's what we do here. And it's our way of a church of coming together and we proclaim, hey, I've been bought and paid for. I'm on the winning team. My Savior is sovereign and He's sovereign over my life. I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I put my faith and trust in Him. I don't cling to my sin anymore. I cling to Him. And when I mess up, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That's what this is. So if you're a believer in Christ, I'm going to invite Alan up. He's going to gather the elements. If you're a believer in Christ, what we're going to do is we're going to invite you to come up. When you're ready, you can take the elements and come back down, sit down, and you can take it in your seat when you're ready.